So we talked about creation of zero. One of the ways to, for creation of zero was basically seeing a parallel, R, a parallel branch, a shunt branch, which was a series RC that created a zero. Now, we will talk about a different way of creating zero quickly today. And that's also another, essentially, a recipe for creation of zero. We've spent a lot of time talking about poles. But in terms of zeros, one is this two-path system right? that you, you're familiar with right now. So the idea of a two-path system, so you have, imagine that you have an input ideal voltage source, and then you have an RC, a parallel RC, uh, R1 and C1, and a second path with R2 and C2. And then let's imagine that there's an amplification, some an ideal amplification. So this amplifier has an infinite, imp it's an ideal voltage amplifier. So these amplifiers have infinite input impedance and zero output impedance, or however you're trying to combine the output. I mean, if you're adding voltages or currents, we are not really concerned with that. Somehow we are adding them ideally. I mean, there are different ways to do that. So this is the V out, or you can say Y and X, or V in and V out. Let's do it V out. So the transfer function of this thing, obviously, is you can think about it in two different ways. One is that you can think about this since this voltage is forced to be V1, you're using an ideal voltage source with no source impedance, you basically have there's what happens on this side, on the upper branch, or upper path, more accurately, is independent of what happens in the lower path, right? So one of the criteria, for example, to see if you have uncoupled poles uh, or uncoupled time constants more accurately was to see if shortening or opening, shortening or opening of the other capacitors and inductors would have an impact on the time constant you see. And you can see clearly in this case, there's one time constant here, which basically is, since this is infinity and this is zero, the time constant associated with C1 is tau one zero, which is basically we call a tau one without the superscript because it's independent of whether or not this capacitor is shorted or open, right? It's always R1, C1. And similarly, in this path, you have a tau 2, 0, which we call it just tau 2, again, because it's an uncoupled one. So we drop the superscript um, of R2, C2. You can see that these two paths are independent of each other, uncoupled from each other, right? The time constant of one is not affected by the shortening or opening of the other capacitor or the other inductor, if there were other elements, reactive elements. So what that does, essentially, is that you have this two paths, two transfer functions. So this one has a transfer function h1 of s, and this one has a transfer function h2 of s, right? Which you can write, obviously, h1 of s is um, a1 over 1 plus tau 1 s, where tau 1 is R1 C1, and H2 of s is A2 1 plus tau 2 s. And the transfer function of this overall system, the aggregate system, is uh, again, you can see through the summation, is the sum of these two outputs, which we can write as H of s being h1 of s plus h2 of s, which becomes clearly, I mean, it's the sum of these two polynomial, uh, first order transfer functions, tau 1s plus a2 over 1 plus tau 2s, which you can easily write as, then if you form a common denominator, which is the product of the two denominators, first order denominator, you will get a second order in the denominator. You have two poles, which are the natural frequency. That you can see that since they're uncoupled, the poles of the overall system is really the, two, the individual poles of individual paths. The natural frequencies have, are not affecting each other because they're not coupled to each other. And then what you will be left with, so there's an A0, right? And then there's a 1 plus some tau Z S. Right? And tau z here, you can easily show by doing basic algebra, is a1 tau 2 plus a2 tau 1 over a1 plus a2. It is some sort of a weighted average of the two time constants. Right? It's a weighted average of the two time constants weighted by the gains of the two paths. So this is a, now the, the first order thing to observe, or the first thing to observe is that you started with two systems, individually with one poles, and then you've put them in parallel. You had two, two paths, and then you created a zero. 
So this is another recipe for creation of zero, so two signal paths that are parallel with each other. And you can see that the, pole, the zero is created this way. So, so that's the frequency of the zero, and there's a zero associated with that. That's, that's fine. So now the question is, and if you want to calculate actually the zero itself, the frequency of the zero, zero is obviously happening at the root of the numerator. Therefore, z would be negative 1 over tau z, which would be essentially a1 plus a2, negative a1 over a, plus a2 divided by a1 tau 2 plus a2 tau 1. So that's a zero frequency if you wanted to calculate it. It's a, now, is it a left half plane or right half plane zero? Can you tell by just looking at this? Where is this zero with respect to the two poles? It's not obvious, right? It could be essentially anywhere with respect to them. Because it, and what determines where it would be? The values of A1 and A2 compared to the tau 1 and tau 2. Right? So the relative sizes of these two will determine where this zero falls. So let's find out where this zero falls and what the implication for the system response is. So let's imagine that you have, so this is, now one thing we know though is that this zero is going to be a real. Right? We know that. How do we know that? There are several ways to tell. Why don't you suggest a couple of ways? Or at least one way. So, why is the zero real? All of our constants and gains are real. All, all of our times, constants, and gains are real, so that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is that it is not possible, for a real system, you cannot have a single complex zero, right? If you have one zero, it has to be real. If you have one pole, you ha it has to be zero. If you want, if they come in complex conjugate pairs. So if you have one, it is real. Okay, so now there are two poles. So let's say the two poles are, again, this is negative, well, this is P1, which is negative 1 over tau 1, and this is P2, which is negative 1 over tau 2. Right? So the two poles are in two locations. And they're not moving. The poles are not moving with the change of A1 and A2. Right? The poles are sitting where they are. The only thing that's changing its position is the zero. So let's see what happens. Now, if let's, let's, we will consider diff different conditions. So first condition is that if both A1 and A2 have the same sign, let's say for the sake of argument for now, let's say they are both positive. Okay? Then what can you say about where the zero falls? The t zero time constant or the zero frequency. Look at the zero time constant, it's probably easier to see. It falls between the two time constants, right? And by the way, we, the way we've drawn these things, the assumption here is that the magnitude of P1, so we're assuming the way it's drawn, you're assuming P1 is smaller than P2, which means that tau1 is greater than tau2. I mean, it's arbitrary, we just pick the one that's larger, call it tau1, and the one that's smaller, tau2. So let's stick with that. Now, if they're both real, both A1 and A2 are positive, then what happens? Where is, where is the zero? In between. In between, right? The same thing if they're both negative, right? If A1 and A2 are both also negative, then they will also fall in between, right? So if they have the same sign, the zero would be in between. So here, in this area, this is where you have A1, A2 greater than zero. So the zero would be somewhere in the middle, let's say for a second, here. If you have the two paths having the same sign. And we'll see why this is important when you talk about the time domain response of this thing. So now what are the other scenarios? The other scenarios, you can actually look at this combination and find out where things fall. So the simplest one is that, again, if you look, for example, at A1 and A2. A1 over A2 being smaller than zero, which is obviously outside this range, but still greater than negative 1, would correspond to this range. I mean, it's very easy to just basically do the algebra, the inequality, and calculate it. And you will see that if their A1 over A2 ratio, right, you could also express this in terms of A1 over A2. You can say A1 over A2 is greater than 0, if you want to keep everything in terms of A1 over A2. That would have the same result. But if a1 over a2 is greater, smaller than 0, between negative 1 and 0, then your 0 will be between the first pole and the origin. 
but still left half play. Right? So that's something to think, keep in mind. So, so just, and you can, again, this became something we can count. Now, if A1 over A2 is greater than tau 1 over tau 2, but smaller than negative 1, then what happens is that your pole, your zero, would be on the right half plane. So this is going to be a right half plane zero. And then, of course, if a1 over a2 is even smaller than negative tau1 over tau2, then it will fall on this end. So this is basically when a1 over a2 is smaller than negative tau1 over tau2. So those are the four conditions for this. So, so, so far, what we've done is basically just algebra, right? Um, so it's not by itself the most useful thing to do, but again, it, it gives us insight about something, as we'll see in a second. So let me just quickly check something here. Yeah. OK. So this is basically what you see in terms of the position, relative position of the thing. So now the key to having a right half plane 0, I mean, the, the signature of it or the requirement is this. So why is this important? Why does, what, what do these things tell us, for example, if it's a, that, well, to understand that, we can use this system to also understand the time domain response. For example, the step response of the system. And from this, we can see what the effect of zero is, where the location of the zero with respect to the poles would determine what kind of response you get, and what are the signatures of different behavior, for example. So let's start. Let's say we start with a case where we are here, between the two poles, right? In other words, a1 over a2 is greater than 0. The two have the same polarity. The two paths have the same polarity. Positive or negative doesn't matter, just like, but they, are, they have the same polarity. And now, the other thing that we are having in this case, so basically they could have any arbitrary ratios as long as they're great. So let's look at that situation and reproduce it here. So let's say scenario 1 is basically where your, pole, your 0 is between the poles. So in this case, we know that a1 over a2 is greater than 0. I'm just going to reproduce it here. a1 over a2 is greater than 0. They have the same polarity. So what is the step response of the aggregate system, if you think about it? Well, let's think about the step response. What does it consist of? So, there is a, so this is the time domain response. What is the step response of the system 1? Now, which one is, by the way, both of these systems individually, both of these paths, have what kind of step response? What kind of a system are they? They are a first order system, so they are an exponential, right? The step response or impulse response would be an exponential. So both of them would be exponentially going from some value to the, the initial value to the final value. And they're both going in the same direction. The only thing is that there's a difference between their um, time constants, right? And from what we wrote up there, we know that tau 1 is greater than tau 2 meaning that system one is the slower system. The top system is the slower system. The bottom system is the faster one. So what happens if you have two impulse responses? So let's, let's look at the impulse responses. So you can have the system one. We can show them with two different colors. Um, the system one is the slow one. And system two is the fast one. Well, these are not, I mean, let's make, let make them a little bit more dramatically different. a little bit smaller. I'm still not happy with it. Okay, that's better. So this one asymptotically reaches some value here, and this one asymptotically reaches some, some other value. So the, what is the final value it reaches? Obviously, what is the value? A1 and A2, right? So this is going to be, this value is A2, this value is A1. So what is the aggregate response of the system? It's the sum of these two responses, right? So what does it look like? So in the beginning, you mostly see the behavior of the fast system, right? So you see essentially this, and then it kind of gets there, but it doesn't quite get there. It just kind of slowly goes up. This has a name, this kind of behavior. If you see something that almost gets there, but then there's like slow, this, this is called a droop. We call this a droop. Right? 
And what it is essentially is a system that gets to its final, close to its final value quickly, but takes a long time to settle to its final, final value. Well, this eventually will settle, of course. Just like this would be like that. Okay? Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Most of the times, the answer is it depends. Right? What you're trying to achieve. So if you, for example, are trying to make an amplifier that is amplifying some digital data, right? It's like such a bunch of zeros and ones going through, they're ra rapidly going up and down. What you care really about is how quickly you get to the threshold, right? For the first order. You want to get to the halfway through point as fast as possible because that determines the speed of switching of the next stage, et cetera, et cetera, things of that sort. So for something like that, this may be insignificant or unimportant, right? Now, on the other hand, if you have a, um, an A to D, or, a D, or more accurately, a D to A, let's say, a D to A, right? A digital to analog converter that tries to settle to a value. Let's say you have a 16-bit D to A, right? 16-bit DAC. Now, this 16-bit DAC needs to settle to its final value to within to half an LSP, right? To define that as a conversion time. Now, if you have an amplifier like this, you may say, oh, I'm very fast, my poles are coming in the right place, but it doesn't matter. Just like you get there, but then it doesn't get. So you may be within like 15 LSPs, and it may take you like 10 times as long to get to half LSP. So this is something that you definitely absolutely want to avoid if you're making a DAC, and you want to minimize to the extent that you can. So again, this can be a problem or can may not be a problem. Droop is, is, is an issue, could be an issue. So, but the key is that what is the kind of, so you will have droop when the zero is between. So the thing to remember, if you want to remember something, is that if your zero is between your two poles, two real poles, you will have a droop. Right? So now, what, is the other, what are the other scenarios? So let's look at the other scenarios and see if we can, what we can tell from the simple two-path model that we developed. So the other scenario is basically, let's say you have the two poles. The poles are not moving. But then your zero is, let's say, here. Then what do we know about this system? Well, we know that A1 and A2 have different polarities. And what else do we know about the magnitude of A1 and A2? Which one has a larger magnitude? Absolute value, right? A2. A2. So we know that they have different polarity, and A2 has a larger magnitude than A1. We can tell from that. So from the condition that we derived. And we know they have different polarities. So how would the response, the time domain response, look like? Let's think about that. So the A, so the, let's say which one did we say? The A1 was the slower system, and it had a smaller magnitude. OK? And so it was kind of like it's a smaller system, but it's going in the other direction. Let's, let's make that negative. Right? And then you have a fast system, A2, that has a larger magnitude and is also faster. So it goes and gets to A, asymptotically, reach, asymptotically reaches A2. So what is the aggregate response of these two? The aggregate response of these two is that it goes pretty much like the red. But then it goes up there, but then it kind of like eventually comes back down and settles. It's not going to be touching exactly here, so it's going to be departing from that a little bit. And you can see actually you can get an overshoot. So time domain overshoot is, does not necessarily correspond to complex poles. You can get time domain overshoot from a zero that's closer to the origin than the two poles. So you can get a time domain overshoot. So if you see a time domain overshoot, that does not automatically mean that you have complex poles. Ringing, on the other hand, does. Meaning, what do I mean by ringing? If it goes up and comes back down and does something. If it does more than one. 
That means a complex Poulsen zero. And we'll talk about those in, uh, in a short while. But anyway, so, so that's the, basically the overshoot scenario. So this is basically you can get an overshoot from this zero. Now, the other thing that's interesting, so now let's go to the next scenario. The next scenario is basically your two poles are where they are. And then your zero is a right half plane zero. So this is a right half plane zero. Let's see what the right half plane zero does based on this model. Now, the condition from, again, the top board, this condition, okay, tells us what the values would look like. So what do we learn from that? What do we learn from those conditions in terms of the response of the system and how big these are? What can we say? Well, we can easily say, okay, so we, it says one of the things it says is that A1 over A2 is smaller than negative 1, okay? Now, what does that tell me about the magnitude of A1 and A2? Well, it tells us that which one has to, be, has to have greater magnitude? A1. A1, right? So A1 has to be greater than A2, right? For the, negative, for the ratio to be smaller than negative 1. Now, and we know that they also have the opposite polarity. So let's see what, what we get in this case. So if you look at that in time domain, now what you have, A1, remember, A1 was the slower path, right? So the slower path, I can show it with now positive polarity, has a larger gain. I use the one that has a larger gain with a positive gain. So, okay, something like that. So that's A1. And then your A2, which is, has a smaller polarity, but it's quick. So this is A2. Okay? Now what would you get? See, in the beginning, A2 is quick, right? And it has a small amplitude, so it would push it down. So it would go down and then eventually come back up. Agree? So what do we have here? We have an undershoot. And we said before, and this is another way to see this, that undershoot is the signature. If you see an undershoot in a response, it's the signature of right half plane zero. And here you can see it, if you see this. Now, the fourth scenario, which is basically when this guy happens at the other end, you can show that you will have basically one of the responses dominating the other one. So your response pretty much looks like a first order response and nothing exciting happens. So this is negligible. But if you look at back at this in terms of what kind of behavior we have, so here we have droop, right? Here we have overshoot. Here we have undershoot. And here the effect of zero is negligible. OK? So that's basically the big picture of creation of zero. Now, the most important takeaways are the signature of the zero, the right half plane zero, the undershoot, the fact that you can have overshoot without having complex po poles, the fact that if you have a zero in between two real poles, you will get a droop, and most importantly, the fact that if you have two signal paths, you can create a zero in the transfer function of the system. Any questions on this? No? Yes? For some of the previous zeros we encountered, there was this kind of coupling input to output, in a sense, when you um, change the value of the component. Is there any way to think about that in terms of the system? Yes. No, that's a great question. That's actually, so we said, you remember before, uh, we, when, we, when we were talking about the transfer constant, we said we can use the transfer constant as a way of understanding where the zeros are, right? I mean, we basically said, if there's a capacitor shortening, shortening of which, produces a non-zero output or an inductive opening of, or combination of capacitors. And the number of zeros essentially was the number of 
the um, maximum number of elements you could simultaneously infinite value that would give you things. So let's see if it applies here. Let's apply all of that. That's, that's actually a great question. So, so here's the thing. Is there a capacitor shortening of which would result in a non-zero output? If I short circuit this one, would I get non-zero output? Yes. yes, through this path, right? If I short circuit this one, would I get non-zero output? Yes, through this path. If I short circuit both of them simultaneously, would I get a non-zero output? Yes. No. So how many zeros do I have from that test? One. Now, left half plane versus right half plane. Let's find out. So if I short circuit this one, does the polarity of the output change? Well, it depends on the relative size of A1 and A2, right? So if you look at that, you will see that you will get this test, essentially, right? Out of that. You could have actually done that. Now, there is also, you have to think about the original polarity and the, the, of the transfer function, because the original polarity of the transfer function, the low frequency part of it is A1 plus A2, and you have to see what the new transfer function's polarity is with respect to what it was before, in terms of A1 and A2, right? So that would, if you do that, you will directly arrive at the same test. So, yes, it's absolutely consistent, and it, as it should be. That's, that's another way to see that. Good question. Any other questions? <laughs>